You are listening to Hit Play, Not Pause, a feisty menopause podcast for active, performance-minded women. I am your host, Celine Yeager. Each week, I bring you advice from athletes, scientists, researchers, and other experts to help you feel and perform your best, no matter what your hormones are doing. This show is a production of Live Feisty Media. Hello, strong, feisty women. I hope you all are well. I have a great show for you this week. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Juliet Starrett, who is the CEO of The Ready State, which is a big mobility company that she founded with her husband, Dr. Kelly Starrett, who is a pioneer in the science and practice of mobility. If you're new to the show, you can go back to episode 23 and check out the interview I did with Kelly on mobility and easing aches and pains way back when we started this thing. It was a great conversation. I highly recommend you checking it out. Now, Juliet and Kelly have a new book out called Built to Move, the 10 essential habits to help you move freely and live fully. What's really cool about this book is that it is literally for everybody, no matter where you sit on the active or athletic spectrum. As Juliet so eloquently explains in this interview, Many athletes and highly active people set their sights on climbing their own personal Everest, whether that's a marathon or a triathlon or what have you, without first really ever getting and spending time at base camp. And then there are people on the other side of the spectrum who are not very active and for whom getting to base camp itself is an excellent goal. And what is base camp? It's the fundamentals we all need to be healthy and active and pain-free. And this book is chock full of self-assessments on everything from shoulder mobility and neck mobility and nutrition intake to breathing techniques and balance and much more, as well as the practices you need to improve in all of those areas. Juliet and I also talk about how she's preparing for menopause, which was the subject matter of a very popular blog post that she put up on the Ready States website. And I will share that in the show notes as well, so you can check it out. She is so down to earth and straightforward and funny, and I just really love this conversation, and I am confident that you will too. All right, before we get to it, remember to sign up for my free weekly blog at feistymenopause.com, where I distill all the latest research and what it means to you. Follow us at Feisty Menopause on Instagram and Facebook. Come on over and join our private Hit Play Not Pause Facebook group. And if you want to dive deeper and have one-on-one time with experts like we have on the show, you can check out our Level Up membership, which you can also learn more about at feistymenopause.com. Finally, quick thanks to That's It for their support. I am honestly at the point where I cannot stomach any more sugary energy foods or gels or chews or candy or any of that stuff when I'm out there training. So I'm very thankful for That's It Fruit Bars. And the fact that they are just figs and dates and mangoes and real food, I just really appreciate it. So thanks, that's it, for your support. All right, enough of me. Let's have a few words about our awesome sponsors and get on with our show. All right, Juliet, as we had mentioned uh, before I hit record, Kelly Starrett is the only male that's ever been uh, on the on the show. He he holds that distinction because he's such a friend of Roar and all things, you know, Next Level and all things that Dr. Stacey Sims is involved with in us. So. Huge fan. I'm he's also a girl him. dad. He's a girl dad. So he has that distinction, too. So. And he can do I mean, a split. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I know it's actually kind of annoying, but it's awesome. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. I see that. I'm like, that's so amazing. So I am super stoked to get to know you and to bring you to the audience. And we have a a ton to talk about. But before we do, um, I really want to talk about uh, the hippo encounter, because I haven't never really talked. Yeah, I've never talked to someone who has survived a hippo attack. And I'm curious what what happened there. And what, what did that look like? That's yeah, terrifying. Well, first of all, um, yeah, terrifying. And first of all, thank you again so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat you up and get to know you more. And um, so thank you for having me here. Uh, let's see. So how do I set the stage for this? Um, and I'll, I'll try to give a Reader's Digest version because I think <laughs> the story in and of itself could probably take an entire hour, which nobody wants to hear. But, um, but the backstory is that I was a 
a division one rower in high school, in high school and college at Cal. But then I went on to become a river rafting guide. Um, okay. And in late 19 or mid 1997, um, I was invited to try out for this extreme whitewater team. Um, I had really no idea what it was. I actually didn't even know it was a sport. I didn't know it was a thing. Um, I most didn't of either. Your listeners I probably your... ever heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, most of your listeners, it's a real fringe sport in the U S but interestingly, um, in the world, it's really not like if you, if you go to certain countries in Asia, like Japan, um, hmm. Eastern Europeans are really into it. Like it's a fully sponsored by the government kind of sport. So it's like one of these totally fringe sports here in America, but like in other countries, it's like taken very seriously as a real thing. And there's been some talk of having it as an exhibition sport in the Olympics. So who knows? Um, but especially back then, which was in the late nineties, it was totally fringe, very emergent sport. Um, and I was like, well, I have this background as a rower. I understand rivers. So, Hey, let's go to this tryout, you know? And I was there with like 60 women, zero expectation. You know, at this point I'm like 24 years old, no idea what to expect. And all of a sudden, next thing I know, I make the team. They actually were only trying out for a single slot. Um, wow. And the how many people was, in a boat? There's a, six a people in a boat. Um, and at that time, the boat was made up of what were truly the most major whitewater legends on earth, like um, a woman, Kelly Kalafatich, who was um, Meryl Streep's stunt double in the 90s movie, The River Wild. I don't know okay. if anyone remembers that movie. Um, I do. With Kevin Bacon. Mm -hmm. And yeah, right. Like you're old enough to remember that movie. And for those of you who aren't, it's really, it's worthy of, uh, it, it stands the test of time in a really funny way. Um, and, you know, women who are in the Whitewater Hall of Fame, national champions. I mean, these women were like legit. And they also had been part of a crew of women um, who had gone around in the late 80s and done first descents on a bunch of really gnarly rivers around the world, like in Russia and Asia. So, I mean, these were like some serious heavy hitters in the whitewater world. Um, and I just think I had the combination of this rowing background combined with river guiding experience. I think that's why I made the team. So I was quite a bit younger than them, had no idea what I was doing. And three weeks after I made the team, we, we were um, at our first national championships. And again, I have no expectation, no idea what's going on. And we win the national championships, at which point I'm told, okay, you're going to go to the world championships on the Zambezi river in Zimbabwe, Africa in two and a half months. So get ready and like, oh make sure God. your life is set up because we're going to be there for a month. Um, because we need it, you know, the Zambezi river is like one of the most epic whitewater rivers on earth. That's all like epic epic biggest class five you can imagine like laughably big class five and we needed to get there weeks early so we could train and learn the river and and so I was like okay all right like this is my life now so this oh all was God. a bit of a shock to me so anyway we um but as we you know when you've taken the time to go all the way to Africa we decide to book a post-race canoe safari in a separate part of Zimbabwe called Mana Pools National Park. So, so just to back up a little bit, we actually go to the world championships. We win, um, which Holy was also shit. a shock to me uh, because again, like I, I, first of all, six months prior to this, I didn't really even know this was a sport. And then next thing, you know, I'm competing at a world championship level event with, you know, 60 other countries, very diverse group of athletes and paddlers at the world championship level. And then we win. So, I mean, this is all just like a complete shock to me, but we, after, and, and quick side note, my mom, who is the coolest was like, wow, my daughter's competing in a world championship and it may be in Africa, but I'm going. Um, so my mom on her own flew all the way there. And in order to actually watch the race, she herself had to raft class five rapids, which was like amazing. So anyway, I just had to set the stage that we've won a world championship. My mom is with us. And now we're going to fly to another part of Zimbabwe to go on this five day canoe safari, which is, it is not on a whitewater river. It's, it's the same river, but it's lower down very wide, like mile wide river, just to kind of set the stage. Um, and I knew that it was maybe going to be a little sketchy when we get to the put in, we meet our guide, Gary, and the entire safety talk is him talking about how many people hippos and crocodiles kill that he's, he's got this weapon and this, like he's got like three guns on his person and a machete and the entire 45 minute safety talk is like hippo croc, hippo croc, hippo croc. And I'm like, this sounds really sketchy. Like this is sketchy. <laughs> like I'm already nervous. So fast forward to day two of the trip and the river 
where in many places is like almost a mile wide and slow moving, like just a little current, but no rapids, um, really becomes very channelized. So there's all these islands and channels. And our guide, I swear to God, says to us, hey, guys, we have two choices. Do you want to go down Hippo City or Hippo Bronx? And so half of us were like, Hippo City, that sounds way better than the Hippo Bronx, like definitely Hippo City. And then the other half of my like really hardcore teammates were like Hippo Bronx, Hippo Bronx. So we lost those of us who wanted to go to Hippo City. Um, But I can tell you that like we were all nervous. In fact, as we enter this channel, which is maybe like 75, you know, 75, 100, like, you know, basically like four lengths of a pool wide. we are dead silent as a group. Like we're super nervous because as we pull into the channel, we can see that there are hundreds of hippos in there, like hundreds. And, and there's this little current, um, and we're all silent. Like it is as quiet as can be silent paddling along. And I take one stroke. And the next thing I know from at top speed from under the boat, I am being catapulted like 12 feet in the air. Oh my God. Um, and so what Gary, our guide had told us during the safety talk is that, you know, the safety, the, the, sa- the gun, the lots of gun safety talk is that, <laughs> you know, hippos are actually just mad and territorial. Um, they're vegetarians, but they're like very aggressive. And so the way that they like kill people is they grab you and attack you with their four foot long tusks and drown you and maim you and whatever. So like, that's kind of the, so he said, you know, if your canoe is attacked, what you want to do is swim away from your canoe. That's like your best hope of survival. So we're like, okay, so um, the I actually, right before I was launched, I actually saw because the hippo hit right by my side of the canoe on my right side. So I'd like taken a stroke and then the hippo came from underneath. And what's crazy is they're super fast underwater and you don't know they're coming. So it wasn't like I saw a wake. I didn't see anything. Like all I saw was a huge hippo mouth. But because the hippo had come with such speed and force before it could chomp down on wh- exactly where I was sitting, I had already been launched like 12 feet into the air and then into the water um, with my boatmate Brooke. Now, thankfully, my mom had been in the was in the boat with the guide. So, I mean, that's just one of those like luck of the things. And, you know, at the time my mom was like maybe 60, but still like she wasn't young and it probably would have been bad if she'd been the one to go in the water. So my teammate and I, Brooke are in the water and we have about a 50. So it's like, imagine two pool lengths. We've got like a 50 to swim to the nearest Island. And I think I was like already swimming before I even hit the ground, like hit the the water. (laughs) Um, but I mean, that was, that was the moment that was the scariest, right? Because we, we know we're in, we know we're in the water with one aggressive hippo who's already mad. And then we would just been catapulted into the water where we had seen another hundred hippos around us and probably crocodiles. And we have to get to this Island. So, I mean, I had did my greatest, like, like Phelps level swimming to this Island. And thankfully we both made it to the Island. Um, and the only like injury other than to our psyches was on my toe. I actually had a cut like on one of my toes and it was because, and mind you, we're in like heavy, thick fiberglass canoe. Um, and so mind you, the, the hippos, two tusks had come all the way through the bottom of the canoe, right where my feet were. And in the moment before I was catapulted into the air, it cut my toe. Wow. Um, and so anyway, the, the long story short, the, our guide tracked down our canoe. This is by the way, in 1997. So like no cell phones or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just like really like dawn of time here. And we're in the absolute middle of nowhere in Zimbabwe. Like there's nothing around. Um, so it's not like we could like call for help or get rescued or anything. Like when I look back and think if we actually really had been hurt or injured, like it would have been extra bad. Um, our guide, Gary tracked down the, apparently the hippo did chase our canoe for a long time, not us. And he was able to get our canoe. Um, and he, uh, repaired the two huge tusk holes in the canoe where I was sitting with by duct taping two Tupperware lids onto the (laughs) canoe. And then we had to continue canoeing for like three more days, which was like the most terrifying. Like I had just come off of rafting many, many days in a row, the biggest class five whitewater on earth. And 
I'll tell you that the three days after that hippo attack <laughs> where I was still on the river with huge hippos, 20 foot crocodiles was like the sketchiest three days of my entire life. So, so yeah, I mean, the great, the, the, you know, facing your imminent death has some, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like an important life lesson. Um, I, I learned a lot of other things from that experience. Um, but one of my favorite stories about that is that for many years I worked as an attorney and we would always have to do these, like these, like, you know, team building games and like get to know your friend, whatever. <laughs> and so anytime we could do like a, get to know your, I, I can always bust out the hippo attack story. So it's like, it has this like nice relevance in terms of like, guess what happened. Um, but yeah, it was a crazy, crazy, you know, like this visceral experience of, being attacked by a 4,000 pound animal. That's like very mad and wants to kill you. Like it's a very weird and very visceral experience. Wow. I'm so glad I asked about this. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw I'm like, I cannot not ask. I mean, I was going through like, just have, I don't even know where I saw it, but I'm like, I must ask her about the hippo story. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's always wow. fun to tell it. And it was a wild, the context is crazy. Um, and it was just a wild experience all around. So, so you, you, you sort of like then retired that career at some point you get into CrossFit, you get into mobility. I mean, you guys yeah. were, I would argue at sort of that, that pointy edge of the whole mobility notions, you know, in the larger sphere, especially of athletics, like 2009, I think you were doing the mobility workouts of the day, right? Yeah, we, yeah, we started the mobility project, which was Kelly and I filming really crap quality YouTube videos in our garage. Um, and, and I will say to give uh, credit where credit is due to my husband, Kelly, Kelly really is the person who popularized the use of the word mobility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he'd gotten, he uh, had been in physical therapy school and you know, obviously there was yoga and stretching and there was some talk of range of motion, but, Little but Pilates. he really, yeah, Pilates, like that, you know, there was some, you know, he, he wasn't like, you know, creating the field or anything, but he really felt like mobility was what was really lacking that people were doing a lot of passive stretching and that mobility was much more effective. And, you know, basically what he wanted to do was figure out ways that people could do what physical therapists were doing to people in their office, but on their own. Um, and that's how the whole idea of mobility was discovered. So it's actually really cool. I sometimes don't think he gets credit where credit is due for sort of popularizing that. And, and a lot of the mobilizations that people are doing are really actually from originally from Kelly's brain where he was like, okay, well, if I had a patient on a table and I wanted to mobilize their hip, I would do this and this, you know, manually, right. By like touching their body. And so he spent so much time trying to figure out like, how could he do these mobilizations to himself and teach people how to do it to themselves without actually having to have an in-person physical therapy appointment. So that was really like the beginning. And now it's like, you know, everybody's doing these mobilizations at the gym and attaching a band and doing all the stuff, but like, that's really like a lot of that is from Kelly's brain. Um, so I, I like to make sure that I properly shout him out because I think that's kind of gotten lost because mobility has become a bit like Kleenex, you know, it's like everybody yeah. just thinks, oh, it's always been there, but it hasn't always been there. It really hasn't. It really, really hasn't. No. And yeah, I a hundred percent like shout away because he does deserve, you know, and you and sort of like being sort of the, the marketing brain behind a lot of this also deserves, you know, a lot of that credit for sort of getting this out into the larger sphere where it inevitably will be adopted and, you know, right. and yeah. Which is flattering, right? Like to the no. extent that like on, you know, on, on a really important level, like to the extent we go to some like random equinox and there's someone who's attached like a band to a rack and is doing like, which we see, you know, we're like, oh, that's Kelly. And like, it's cool. Cause that person doing it has no idea. It's just, yeah. it's become part of, you know, the training in gym lexicon. Yeah, no, it really has. Yeah. And you are also sort of leading on the the thought processes on the ill effects of a sedentary lifestyle. I mean, you, you know, came out with, um, you came out with a book about that same time, 2009 on the, it was the later, um, I believe our book Despond came out in 2014 or 2015. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but we were really early to start talking about it. In fact, sometimes I think it's funny cause there'll be like, you know, current podcasts where people are like, you should walk more and stop it. And I'm always like, Okay. That's so 2010. That's when Kelly and I started talking about that. Um, 
you know, but what, whatever it's, it's, we're, you know, it, it, it is what it is, but yeah, we, it really started. We're still here though. Like people we're are still, still here because yeah. Right. And like, hence our book, by the way, in the background, which we can talk about later, but yep. you know, I, I will say that the reason we started talking about sedentaryism, because again, like sometimes Kelly and I laugh that we're like, well, like we never set out to be people like that are telling people to like walk more and stand, like it's not that sexy. Um, <laughs> because, you know, we, you know, we started in high performance, right? We were like working with professional athletes and teams, which we still do. Um, but what we realize is that weirdly our passion is like trying to expand the net and get more people to move more. And, you know, that's really sort of like our core mission at this point in life. But back then we still owned a physical therapy clinic inside our gym. So we were seeing, you know, both, both people in a training context and, and a physical therapy context. And what we started seeing were a lot of the sort of nagging aches and pains and injuries that we were seeing in our physical therapy clinic were really just the like ill effects of people sitting too much. And most of the people who would see us were, you know, I'd say like weekend warrior kind of CrossFit athletes or triathletes or, you know, people who are really actually active and physical, but in many cases were doing their training and then sitting for 14 hours a day, commuting at their office, whatever. And so in addition to the fact that they just plain weren't getting enough overall movement in their day, um, they were starting to see all these kind of joint related problems related to training and then sitting. And so, so we started telling people like, Hey, you know, if you, cause we would have these like triathletes, for example, come in and say, Oh my God, I don't understand. Like just all of a sudden I tore my Achilles and Kelly and I are like, there's no, all of a sudden about that. Like, you know, any of these like, you know, ligament joint, anything that happened to you, like that's usually like years and years and years and years. And then you do reach a tipping point, right? Like something happens on a day where you reach a tipping point, but like in most cases, it's been years and years of running, moving, sitting, poor movement, whatever the cause is, but it, it never just happens, right? Like there's always an underlying reason for it. But one of the reasons we started seeing were people really having aches, pains, issues, from doing exactly that, just training, maybe doing their one hour CrossFit class from five to six in the morning and then sitting for the rest of the day with their joints at 90 degree angles. So, um, so we really started actually seeing in our clinic, the, the ill effects of people sitting all the time. And, you know, it was almost obvious, like we could have someone in the waiting room who would be waiting in a sitting position, waiting for their appointment, and we would start to do this game of like, what's this person here for? And then we could guess like neck pain because you could see by the way they were sitting and looking at their phone in our waiting room on, their, on the couch, like, oh, okay. Like we just saw how this person is spending 14 hours of their day in that position. No wonder they're here for neck pain, right? But people were not totally making that connection. And I think still don't in many ways, although I think we're starting as an industry to sort of get that message out we're starting to do a better job of getting that message out. Yeah. And it's really important. And it's really important. I too, you know, I wrote a book with Dr. James Levine. I and, love him. Huge in 2009. Fan. I mean, we wrote this book like about sitting disease then, Yes, you know, I, I know, I know you did. That's where I first became aware of you because I found him and I like st actually stalked him on the internet. And then I met him in person and I don't think he'd ever met anyone who treated him like a celebrity sighting like I did. So anyway, so I knew exactly who you were and because of my stalking of James Levine. Well, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. He's, he's such a great, a great human being. Cause but, he was like the first treadmill desk guy, right? Like, yes, was he was. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he, he definitely a pioneer in that space, but like we are talking to, I mean, we're talking to myself. I, I am a writer for a living, so I need to consciously move myself, you know, and, and stand and move around. But that's a lot of people. And when you, it's funny when you're saying like, this doesn't come out of nowhere because a lot of women, when they hit the menopause transition, feel like it does because, you know, the hormones are shifting, making them perhaps more vulnerable um, to these situations. So I feel like, and tell me if you agree, that it's even more important to stay on top of the things that you're talking about, uh, not sitting all day and doing some of the work that we're going to be talking about to avoid those out of nowhere, quote unquote, injuries. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I wrote this, I kind of randomly wrote this article on our blog, like what I'm doing to prepare for menopause. I wanted to and, ask you all about and it. Yep. <laughs> what's funny about it is from a topic standpoint, it was like a little outside the norm of what we would normally write about on our Ready State blog. Like, you know, we're, you know, it, it's just a bit of an out there topic, but it's actually been one of our most popular blogs ever. So I was like, huh, okay. Like there's something to this. You know, we've had Stacey Sims on our podcast and you and I share our uh, uh, great admiration for her and her work. And like, she, you know, she is like my menopause sensei. Um, <laughs> but, but I realized exactly what you're saying. Like, I couldn't agree more. And, it, you know, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of what we're talking about, both with mobility work and the sort of lifestyle recommendations is like, Hey, you know, there's a lot you can be doing now to avoid the future pain. And, and I think menopause is exactly an example of that. Um, and so many of the practices I think that will help us all better survive the menopause transition are very basic, um, but I think really poorly understood. And it's really interesting to actually spend time with other women and talk about how, you know, most of the women I know now, now, especially since I'm in this age range, you know, I'm turning 50 this year. So it's like, I, I know most of my friends are kind of in this 45 to 55 year old age range. So it's a topic of conversation and I think women feel really unsupported and feel like there is a massive dearth of information and available resources on this subject, which, you know, you and I can get into the reasons for that, but it's amazing. And so I, I was really, su I was super surprised by the response of that random little blog I did. I fa in fact, after the fact, I was like, I probably could have done a better job on that. I didn't really, I thought it was just going to be read <laughs> by like seven people. Um, but yeah, so uh, it's a subject near and dear to my heart, both personally and then also because I do think there's so much, you know, women can do. I mean, even starting in their 30s to sort of look forward in time a little bit and think about how they can set themselves up to have it be a smooth transition. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like what you're thinking as far as through your lens? Yeah, so through my lens, um, and again, much of this I have to credit to Stacey Sims and what I've learned from her. So I want to make sure I shout her out like 9,000 times because I am such a fan of hers. Um, but, you know, I think there's some things that that I think are really important. You know, one thing I'd like to say is, and, and you and I are probably in the roughly the same age range, but, you know, we come from like the 90s, 80s, like be as skinny women as possible. Um, and I think we really are all quite damaged from that. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I know I am like, it's been sort of a lifeline, you know, I, I'm not like, I have a not like super lean skinny body type. And so it's been a lifelong struggle for me to try to accept that, like, this is how I look and I'm never going to be that sort of like real skinny body type. Um, yep. and so I, I will say that I think that having that background for those of us who are starting the man, the menopause transition of life in our forties and fifties makes some of the practices that I think are so important, actually difficult because what we were taught, um, as part of that, like be super skinny nineties gym culture is that like cardio is King. And that if you want to burn fat and look better, man, you got to jog for like three hours a day. And, um, Definitely, you know, and then I think, you know, then the 2000s came on and everyone's like, no carbs, definitely don't eat any carbs. So, <laughs> I mean, I feel like, um, I feel like we really got stuck as women in this mentality that, that if we wanted to change our body composition, we needed to do excessive amounts of cardio and super restrict our eating, both of which I now understand to be really bad for menopause, menopausal women and, and being able to sort of gracefully survive that transition. Um, so fortunately I, you know, have been a professional athlete and, and I always have done quite a bit of, and, and I was a D one rower. So I, I have done a fair bit of weight training in my life. Um, but I really credit like, and, and feel very lucky that I found CrossFit. I, I was actually, I think like 29 or 30 years old. And, mm. and I was able to really add in like a pretty regular, um, resistance weight training program into my life. Um, and that really did help me learn the importance of actually having muscle mass on your body, um, in terms of, like, well, there's like five to me, I'm like muscle mass is like, you're like 401k for it's aging everything. and menopause. Like it's everything. Um, like, I'm just like muscle mass, like you can't have enough of it because it's going away. Like we're all on a <laughs> trajectory. So, so, um, so, you know, I was, I feel lucky that I learned that. And I think that's, you know, a, a tradition that, 
Um, I think more women, especially women that are preparing for or starting to go through menopause, you know, really need to appreciate. I think at this point, what we don't all need in our lives is massive amounts of additional stressors in the form of intense and long cardio all the time. And not to say that there's not, we knew, we do still need cardio. Like we need cardio, of course, but, um, the notion that doing extended cardio with a restrictive diet is going to change our body composition, especially when we're in perimenopause and menopause is like, it's like a zero sum game. So I, I think like that would be the biggest thing I hope women take away is like, man, add some kind of strength and conditioning program to your routine two or three times a week. And it doesn't need to be awesome. Like, you know, I obviously come from a CrossFit background. You know, I like to do stuff with like free weights and barbells or whatever, but I literally could care less. Like swing a kettlebell three times a week, a hundred times, or go to a traditional gym and do leg press and, you know, like lat pull downs. It, it, like at this point in my training career, like I'm like, just do some resistance training. Um, and also this may be controversial, but like yoga does not count. There are some movements in yoga that can, that are, are loaded. I would say a couple of movements in yoga are loaded, but like that is not a resistance training program. Like yoga should be, yoga is amazing. You know, I, I would put it in the category of a movement practice. I think it's great for, as a breathing practice, as a meditation practice, movement practice, but like, like please women in your thirties, forties, and fifties, like yoga is not resistance training. Like, please, you have to pick up a load of some kind you know, whether that's 10 pounds, 50 pounds, whatever, it's gotta be a loaded movement. So I think to me, those are the biggest things. I think we're dealing with a population of people who we really got very damaged by the messages being sent to us in the eighties and nineties. And then you combine that with now we're starting to go into this menopause transition with a lot of these really outdated and unhealthy ideas and, and like deep rooted, you know, cause I will say that I know these things. And then I still sometimes have an instinct to be like, well, you know, if I'm feeling a little bloated, I just shouldn't eat a carb for like three, you know, it's like, I'm not, I, I'm not excused from that. Like it's really deep rooted for a lot of us. It really, really is. And we talk about it all the on the show all the time and we can't talk about it enough because you still have, and I hear them in my community, they'll go to a Noom or they'll go to one of these apps or they'll go to these things, you know, and they have them starting at 1200 calories and, you know, or worse, you know, there are these books that are targeted towards women in menopause. They just put them immediately on intermittent fasting and keto, like, you know, 9% carbs from your diet. <laughs> just like, yeah. Yeah. I just want to lay my head yeah. down on my desk. And just... Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I think if like, you know, if I could say two things, it's like, man, add resistance training into your, into your life, whatever that means for you and eat some carbs, um, you know, and an overly restrictive diet, like, and it is not, is, is going to have ultimately the opposite impact. And, you know, everything I've read and learned from Stacey Sims, it's like, you know, and I think this is an ongoing problem that we have, right? Like all these studies, especially nutrition, I mean, there's, there's already a massive nutrition research is already difficult enough than any of it ever done is of course, always ever done only on men. Um, and that is really true for intermittent fasting. You know, I think, um, you know, Stacey Sims is of the mind that it's really horrible for perimenopause and menopausal women. Um, and all the studies that have ever showed the positive benefits of intermittent fasting have all been done on men. So it's like, it's either like neutral, like we don't know if it's good for women or we know it's bad, but we definitely have no data showing it's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's hard. It, it makes it, and, and we don't need to do a whole show of this because I have done a whole show on it, but it does make it hard to get the other elements that you need. You need like protein spread throughout the day. You need, you know, there's all these other things that you need and it just makes it hard to get to fuel yourself properly um, as an active woman, you know, in, in in the time frame that you need to do that. I read that in that piece, though, that you did talk about being a self-proclaimed evangelist of the 800 gram challenge. Like, can you talk a bit about what that is? Huge fan. In fact, it um, it actually got a whole chapter in our upcoming book, oh. our new book, our new book, Built to Move. Um, okay. uh, and uh, we think it's, we call it eat like you're going to live forever. Um, but it's, it's two components, which you mentioned, which I'll say, and the first of the 800 gram challenge, which, um, is originally created by our dear friend and nutrition badass EC Sinkowski. Um, 
but it was based on a research study that showed a, like overall a, a, and a good one, by the way, I realize there's research, like anyone could pluck whatever crap research they want. I'm saying like a very well done peer reviewed research study that showed that people who ate um, 800 grams of fruits or vegetables or more had better health, health outcomes, like across the board. So less disease, longevity, you know, of all the sort of health metrics that we care about were improved. Um, and the thinking behind that is that people are getting the kind of diverse micronutrients they need in their diet from like a wide array of fruits and vegetables. Um, and you know, the standard American diet is like, massively lacking in fruits and vegetables. And in fact, most Americans only eat like five vegetables. It's like carrots, celery, broccoli, right. something, right? So, so in addition to generally speaking, we're not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Um, we aren't eating a wide array. And so what I'll start by saying is like, let's first talk about fruit and go back to this topic we talked about, um, which is some very bad advice we all got as women in the eighties and nineties, which has you know, damaged us all. Um, and one of those things is that fruit is bad for you, which is truly preposterous. I mean, like literally the fact that the banana was demonized by the health and fitness industry is <laughs> unbelievable. Like people are not overweight or obese or carry belly fat because they're eating apples and bananas and blueberries. Like that is not the problem. Like we're overweight or obese because we have easy access to highly palatable, high fat, um, processed foods like that, you know, and, and that that's what we're marketed, right? Like that, that fruits and vegetables are literally not the problem. Like knock your head, like, like no one's ever going to do a study on this, but like someone could probably eat five bananas a day and otherwise follow a fine diet. And like, they're going to be fine. Like it's, this is not the problem. So I think, I think part of this, part of what I like about this is that it just cuts through all this crap advice we've been given for years. Um, and also it's the anti-restriction. I mean, this is like, I'm so anti-restriction at this point in my I life. Too. Um, I just am over restriction and especially especially for, again, in this group of menopausal women, um, yep. it's an expansion. So it's basically yes. saying, eat whatever fruits and vegetables you want. Make sure you get 800 grams. It's actually not that hard to get. I mean, I think for some people it seems like a lot, but I mean, if you ate five large apples in a day, that's 800 grams. So done like, great. If that's, you know, or if you, there, there's just the, the ways that you can get 800 grams of fruits and vegetables in your life is like massive. It's so can be based on preference and choice and what you like and don't like. Um, but it's just such a great organizing principle because it's not restrictive. It's expansive. You know, you, you can eat 800 grams of fruits or vegetables or more. And there's some things that are included in there. Like God forbid, one of the things we were all told to restrict in the early aughts, like legumes, right? Like those count or a potato actually counts, right? Not fried, not a fry, but like a potato. So it's like this sort of expansive way of thinking about food that is like really lovely. I would say after all these years of saying restrict, 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 restrict. Um, and then the other component that we recommend in our book, which you alluded to earlier is eating enough protein, which I also think is critical for women and of all ages, um, but especially going into this perimenopause, menopause transition. Um, you know, there's so many reasons for this. I mean, number one, you know, to the extent we're all, you know, trying to do some resistance training and build muscle mass, we need protein on board to be able to do that. Um, just the satiety factor, right? Like mm. to the extent that, you know, it's easy to like eat cookies or popcorn or whatever. It's like, you know, I really do find that if I have eaten protein at each one of my meals and eaten enough protein that, that I, I am much less likely to snack, you know, like, like my personal problem, if I have a dietary problem is that, you know, if I is when I under eat throughout the day and definitely if I under eat protein, and then when I'm making dinner for my kids, I will eat an entire bag of popcorn while I'm making them dinner because I'm right. like, like, I'm not beyond, right. Like I'm not beyond that. Like we all have whatever our problems are. <laughs> um, but I find that if I eat enough protein throughout the day, that I am way less likely to have a desire to eat crap. Um, and that I feel fed and fueled. And then I know that, that I'm going to get the downstream benefit of the resistance training I'm doing. So, right. you know, to me, it's like, it's like, I'm all about like, eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables, hit your protein target and like, check, like, that's it. Right. You're right. Gonna, like, like if the goal is, if the goal is not being so skinny, if your goal is to be healthy 
and be, you can be healthy at a variety of weights. You know, it doesn't just mean skinny. Um, man, this is like such an expansive way. Like people we know who follow this are like, oh my God, I get to eat so much food. 800 grams of fruits and vegetables. Like, wow, this is the first time I'm eating a lot of food. So, um, and then you get the side benefits of having all these diverse and lovely micronutrients in your body, which are overall good for your health. So, um, and super so good for menopause, like your gut health, ooh, like when yes. you find like all that fiber, I mean, women need more in the menopause transition. I've done shows on it, like 30 grams is actually helping with your hormones, not just like digestive health, but all of yes. it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've just, for me, uh, you know, I've been exposed to and tried every like form of eating every restrictive, not restrictive, whatever. And, and like, this has been the thing, like we discovered this thanks to EC, I don't know, five years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And it's like totally transformed how we think about food and how we eat. And, you know, it's super interesting because you'll even see our staff here at the ready state, everybody will come in with like their Tupperware with like a variety of like fruits and vegetables every day. And then it's like, if you try to eat like a pepper out of someone else's, they're like, wait, that's my grams. Like, so it's just, it's just been a really simple, easy way to have this like lovely health practice that doesn't feel, and, and you can be like a normal person. You can go out to dinner and, and do normal things. Imagine right. that. Oh, I love it. I, I, I absolutely love that. Cause I too am on that bandwagon and I'm preaching it constantly. It's about what you can add. Like, what can you add to your, to your life, to your diet? What can you add? It's, it's so much, it's so much healthier. And and you're going to have like stress benefits and brain benefits and all the things that, because it's so stressful to restrict, restrict, restrict. It's just yeah. not good for you. Right. And I just think, it, and the other thing I like to think about with those hard cardio workouts, you know, and even like some really hard CrossFit workouts, like I've had to kind of tone it down in recent years. Like, you know, the way I like to think about those really difficult cardio pieces or metabolic pieces is like, that's also a stressor on your body. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you want to try to like reduce the total amount of stressors, right? So if like your workout is a stressor and then you have a stressful job and then you're stressing your body by restricting your food, like you're just a giant stress mess. And then menopause is going to be all the more difficult. Yeah. Well, and, and that sort of dovetails into another thing that I wanted to ask you about that you had, I think written about in the piece that we were referring to is that you do not surprisingly a lot of mobility work but you also talk about doing your mobility practice to down regulate and recover in the evening. Like what are you, how are you using your mobility practice? Yeah. I mean, I do, I do a couple things usually after I work out, like I'm obsessed with a couch stretch because I think it's the antidote to sitting our sitting lifestyle. Um, so I do usually couch stretch after I work out whenever that is, but I do most of my soft tissue work at night. Um, I like probably most of your listeners, love to unwind at night by watching a little television. Like I love, like, it's just, you know, yep, yep. I, it's, you know, I I'm doing what everybody else who was listening to this is doing. It's like, I'm watching Netflix and hanging yep. out in the night. Yep. And that's kind of a nice, you know, transition for me before I go to bed. And so usually I sit on the, you know, we, we do, we have the strategy, which we call peppering our environment, um, which mm. is to make it easier to make good decisions. Um, and so we have peppered our living room with a variety of mobility tools. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, a basket with like balls and rollers and, you know, like hypervolts and, um, you know, just ways that we can kind of like niggle on our body while we're watching TV. So I usually spend 10 or 15 minutes or sometimes even half an hour, right? If I'm kind of engaged in something, just rolling out my calves or my quads or sitting on a ball or, you know, just doing some kind of pigeon pose stretching. Um, the other thing I really love is Jill Miller's um, gut smash. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but I find mm -hmm. that to be extremely down regulating. You take kind of like a, um, she actually has a ball she sells called the courageous ball. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a, almost like a child's, uh, like larger size, like volleyball size rubber ball, but it definitely has some flex to it. And if you actually lay on it and sort of use it to kind of mobilize your gut and diaphragm, it's like weird in, in that it's, it's like, it's like tranquilizing in terms of relaxation. Like it's just one of the most relaxing hmm. mobilizations we ever do. Um, and so, yeah, I use that time, you know, the other thing, uh, as a quick subtext here that I'm all about is I think one of the things that we've 
done in the fitness industry that we could do better, I, I guess that's a nice way of putting it, is that we've given off this impression that those of us who are in this industry, like we don't actually work, that we just exercise for three hours a day and then do our meal prep. And then we do our meditation practice and mm -hmm. journal and then whatever. And it's like, okay, that is not what people's lives are like at all. And in fact, that's not what my life is like. Like I'm running a business. Um, I'm raising two kids. You know, I don't have time to wake up and journal and do all that stuff. Stand I'm, outside barefoot and stare at the sun for No, I don't have time for that. Like I'm like making my kids lunch and getting my, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm momming and, and running businesses and answering emails and, you know, and the vast majority of my day is actually in front of my laptop, um, working, uh, you know, like, like most people are. Um, and I, I tend to, you know, have to work long hours and, um, and so, what, what one of my missions is, is like, how can we do a better job in the industry? And I think this is, you know, one of our, our big focuses in our book built to move is what are these sort of basic practices you can do in life and, and how can you fit them in to your day without, because the way I like to think about it is like, okay, everybody has one hour to do some kind of like fitnessing thing, right? Like whether that's yoga or a workout or a run or a jog, like the vast majority of people, let's say they, they probably have like one discretionary hour in their day to like do well. And then if we're telling them like, okay, yeah. And you need to like perfectly meal prep and do a meditation practice and a breathing practice. And you definitely need to practice your balance and do all this stuff. It's like, people are going to be like, no, right? Like we all have to choose and make priorities in our lives. So one of the things we've tried to do in our book and sort of in our life generally is, is, develop ways that people can add these things into things they're already doing, um, which is part of the reason why we love the TV watching mobility practice, because we're all doing it. I mean, I think the, the research shows that like the average American is sitting in front of their TV for like three hours a night. So we've got time. We're, we're a captive audience. Um, and we just have found that in addition to having this lovely sort of down regulatory impact on our sleep, which we're obsessed with sleep, um, down regulatory impact on our sleep, it, we have time and it, it's sort of like, you know, it's just this easy thing to fit in without, it doesn't feel additive or one more checkbox to do like one more thing. All of us like busy working moms have to add to our day. It's like something that it's, it just, fits super nicely, you know, sit on the floor and, and even just sitting on the floor. I mean, even if you're like, I'm yeah. too tired to roll out my quads. Like I have plenty of nights where I'm like, I can't even do that. Like I'm exhausted. I just spend 10 or 15 minutes sitting on the floor because it's, yeah. you know, it's a good practice. It is a very, it's a very good practice and getting up and down off the floor is a very good practice. I, um, speaking about the book, I have, I have a couple other questions for you, but like, if we want to dovetail a little bit into the book, it is, um, as you've mentioned, it's built to move and it's 10 essential habits to help you move freely and live fully. And it is out now. I read on your Instagram that the book is targeted to exercisers and non-exercisers alike. And I'm wondering where you found that Venn diagram. Like what exactly, you know, is, is that yeah. intersection? Well, I think um, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of like how this book came to pass. And then, then I think that'll help answer this question. But, okay. you know, as I said before, like we got our start working with, you know, professional athletes and military units and, you know, coaches coaching professional athletes. Like that's sort of how we got our start in like the high performance environment. Um, and we actually saw in that environment first that those people were missing the basics. Um, and so the, the analogy we like to use is that the practices in this book are like base camp mm -hmm. and that what we've seen a lot of people doing is they're trying to climb Everest, but they actually, they, you can't climb Everest until you get to base camp. Um, like I would put supplementing in that category, like tons of amazing supplements out there, lots of controversy, but you know, uh, whatever, I, I'm not even going to wade into that because whatever supplements are a whole thing. But I would say, look, like if you aren't eating 800 grams of fruits and vegetables and getting protein from and, and getting protein from food sources, um, and you're not sleeping and you walk 1000 steps a day, like, you know what, like the supplement is not going to be what makes a difference in your health, you know? And, uh, you know, there's just, I think we've, again, the way that we've sort of missed, missed the mark, I think in the fitness business is we've encouraged a lot of people to try to climb Everest before they're at base camp. Um, and I think part of it is that climbing Everest is way sexier than being at base camp. It's way sexier on Instagram. You know, it's like going to bring more people in. It seems cool. Um, but you know, in the end, um, you know, 
even the professional athletes we've worked with over the years aren't moving enough outside of their training. They aren't eating enough fruits and vegetables. They, their sleep is super disrupted. Um, a lot of them, you know, are horrible at following any kind of basic mobility practice. So it's like, so that's what we mean by like the exercisers, right? Like, and, and that's not just like, that's not just weekend warriors like me. That's like professional athletes are missing the basics. Yeah. Then when we get down to kind of the weekend warrior category, which I'd put myself in, right? Like I love to exercise and I always have, and you know, whatever it's, it's always been part of my life. You know, we also are missing the basics, but, but the, the other thing that really informed this book for us is that, you know, we live in this lovely suburban community. We're raising two kids. We have a ton of friends and people in our community who have literally nothing to do with the health and fitness industry. Like not nothing at all. Like we have plenty of those friends, but we have like plenty of what I would call normal, normal. friends. <laughs> you know, they have like normal jobs. Those normal people. Normal, whatever. I, you know, it's like, exactly. And so I we, understand because of what we've done professionally, we are kind of the go-to people in our broader community for general health and fitness advice. And these are the people who have approached us for years saying, Oh my God. Okay. I think I should, I should intermittent fast and maybe I should try keto and wait, should I do F45 or yoga, hot yoga? I mean, like people are totally confused. Like we have done a horrible job in the fitness business. Like I'm giving us an F as an industry. Like we're getting an F right now. I'm right with you. What we've done is we've made ourselves better, right? Like we're okay. Let's say we're 0.1% of people. We've made ourselves better, man. I tracking everything on my aura ring and Kelly and I are in our sauna and our cold plunge. We're taking the right kind of supplements and we're doing personalized medicine. We're, that's great. And everything except for we've 100% left everybody else behind. Like we have done a horrible job of bringing people into this tent of health. Um, and, and what I would describe health as or fitness as, and how I would define it is maybe different from other people, but what I would describe it as is really, are you able to do the things that you want to be able to do physically, um, without pain or injury? Um, and what we see is that, you know, most people don't really care if they have like shredded abs or get a PR on their Kona triathlon, you know, what they care about is, are they pain-free? Do they feel good? Do they feel good enough to do the things they want to do? Whether that's like walking around Disneyland for 25,000 steps with their family or doing a triathlon when they're 60. Right. And so I think that perspective is really what, what we mean by kind of the non-exercisers is that having a community of people like that has really sort of informed us that like, actually these basic practices are universal. Like it doesn't matter in what industry, whether you're a non-exerciser or non-exerciser, like we're, the exercisers have skipped base camp and trying to climb to, to Everest, right? Like that's where the exercisers are. They've mm -hmm. lost, they've lost the narrative in you know, tracking their heart rate variability and never eating a vegetable. That's what the, egg. and then the non-exercisers we've left them behind. And so that's what we mean by that is like, we're trying to kind of bring people together and say, Hey, let's all meet up at base camp. Um, for the non-exercisers base camp is as far as you need to get. That's awesome. Get to base yeah. camp. The base camp practices are what is going to help you live long, be durable, feel good, limit the amount of pain and injury you are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. And for the exercisers, we're like, Hey, you've missed the narrative here. Like you, like the amount of people we've talked to who literally don't eat a vegetable, but you know, like meditate, cold plunge, ice bath, and take 40 supplements a day are many. I bet. So, um, so that's where we kind of like, that's the nexus we've tried to create, right. Is like, how do we bring people, the exercisers down from the summit of Everest and the non-exercisers, how do we invite them to the conversation? Julia, you did that. That is the most beautiful description of a <laughs> book you. I have ever heard of. I'm not like, that was- Thank you. Poetry. That was so wonderful. Thank you I don't, so much. I, I'm, I'm yeah. working on it. Thank you. Oh no, you don't need to <laughs> stop working. Like that is as refined and perfect as it's going to get. That is an amazing analogy. Because it's, I can, it is so true. And I've been in this industry a long time too. And I, yes. that is, uh, I love that. And we will put a link to the book in the show notes for everyone Thank who's you. interested because I definitely, um, I'm all in. I completely, completely get it. Um, I, I guess if I can ask, where are you? Because I think you wrote the piece on menopause maybe a couple of years ago. I can't remember when you wrote it, but I, I know it wasn't yeah. yesterday. So where are you in that journey now? 
Yeah. So I think I was 47 when I wrote that I'm 49, but I'm turning 50 this month, April. Um, so I'm in it. I am fully in it. Um, I will say I do generally feel slightly critical of like the greater medical establishment because I, I don't feel that, um, you know, for example, my OBGYN and other people are sort of like, well, good luck to you. Like, this is how you're going <laughs> to like, there's not a ton of, uh, support, which is why I've, you know, I'm lucky to know all these amazing women like you and Stacey Sims and Jill Miller and all these other women who are trying to support other women in this process, because they don't think the sort of traditional medical doctors are, are quite sure how to manage all of us. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, uh, the, the, one of the things I noticed that's really interesting, um, that's been a big transition for me is, is actually some like uptick in anxiety, which I don't oh, think boy. a lot of, right. Um, I didn't know and, that was a symptom and I wish I had when I was no, going through it. Yeah. And I don't, I didn't, I don't really think even when I wrote the menopause article, I was quite aware of that probably because I hadn't really experienced it myself. You know, I would say that you know, if I have any, I think I've mostly in my life been able to kind of control my anxiety through exercise and movement. Like that's been sort of my own, my own salve for any anxiety. And there have been a few times in the last year or so where I'm like, I'm able to, fortunately I'm able to kind of name it and know what I'm feeling, but I'm like, wow, I feel overwhelmed in a way that I have never felt in my life before. Like things that wouldn't have overwhelmed me two years ago are now overwhelming me. Um, and so for me, that's, I, I think that's been the biggest surprise, right? The, I, I feel like I've done a decent job prepping myself and, you know, in terms of nutrition and prioritizing sleep and resistance training. And, you know, I, I think I've done a really good job. I feel sort of good about my approach there, but I think that was the thing that came out of nowhere and surprised me was the anxiety piece. Um, and it does feel like weirdly hormonal. You can, you're like, wow, all of a sudden I feel like I'm overwhelmed with anxiety. And then like two hours later, like, and now I'm fine. Um, so yeah. I think that's what surprised me the most. Um, and I think what's helped me manage it is sort of knowing what it is, like rather than feeling afraid, like, oh my God, I'm, I'm super fearful of the fact that I'm having this experience. I've been able to say, okay, all right, this clearly is a perimenopause situation and it's going to pass and it isn't my full-time reality. So, you know, that's sort of how I've been managing up to this point, but I mean, that was surprising to me. And I think something that hasn't been talked about enough and that enough women aren't getting support for, because I have to think, you know, maybe I'm sort of like middle of the road, but there's probably women who experience 10 times the anxiety that I am and probably with very little support. Yeah, so. I a hundred percent agree. That is that was the one that blindsided me as well. And I didn't know what it was. So yeah. it was just, I felt like I was losing my mind in some ways, you know, I mean, just waking up in the middle of the night, feeling like everything was going, like the sky was falling. It oh was yeah. Just, like my thing now is I wake up at almost like four 30 every single night. And like my brain is, and, and actually I've just sort of come to accept it now. And I just read, I usually just like read for half an hour, something else. And I can kind of turn that, that kind of crazy brain off. But yeah, I yeah. mean, just sort of like this waking up at four 30 with like weird doomsday thoughts or like <laughs> stressing about my to-do list or whatever. Like it's, it's the just, worst. It's the worst. And it's, yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think just talking about it and having more women know that like, this is part of the process and it's normal. Um, and, you know, obviously if it gets extreme, like, you know, you should see a doctor of course, yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. but like I, 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 until I, I had literally no idea that that was, you know, that that was sort of on the menu of menopause until I started experiencing it myself. So that's where I'm at. I'm just sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm facing it down head on right now and just trying to do it gracefully and focus on my basic health practices. And, and thank you for, for sharing that. I mean, thank you for being open. I'm always, when I saw that piece, it just, whenever I see a woman of your stature or somebody who's out there also opening up about this topic, it makes my heart grow a little bit because it, there's still like, you know, it, it's gotten way better, but there's still this stigma and there's this shame and there's this cloaking and it just, it just vanishes when people start talking and it's really makes a difference. You are really making a difference. So thank you. Yeah. And I mean, seriously, thank you because I mean, besides honestly, like you and Stacey Sims are the two people I 
you know, right now you're the resources, right? Like it's, that's it. Like if people ask me again, because I'm kind of often like the sort of node of questions about anything health and fitness, like, like I, at this point, it's like Stacey Sims, Celine, go follow their stuff. Like they're the two people out there that are like really talking about this, making this relevant and supporting women in like an extremely important way. So like giant props to you for what you're doing, because it's such a major time in women's lives and such a huge transition and can be so scary. And I, I just think the more open and more available everybody is about it, the better it's going to be for more women. So serious props to, to you and all the work you're doing around this. Okay. Well, thank you. And I will say, you know, now that I am, and I am on the other side of it, I have come to appreciate the transition can be an amazing place of power. Like you can come out of this thing, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of power that can come out of it. Um, so it's, yeah. You know, one yeah. thing I will say, if, just to add to that is that this is, and maybe this is just an age thing and has nothing to do with menopause, but as I'm cresting 50, you know, I probably most of my life have been kind of a people, people pleaser. And I'm cresting into this phase where I'm like, I actually really don't care what people think about me as much. And like, that's a really powerful position, right? Like it's, you know, I, I, like, I have no idea if there's any connection to menopause, but it, it's definitely like a life phase thing. And it's a nice place to be. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, that's our show. Buckle on up and come on back next week when I sit down with the unstoppable Lou Featherstone, who is on a mission to help others grow old disgracefully, as she likes to say. We talk all about her self-love tour of the U.S. and so very much more. You won't want to miss this one. So come on back next week. And until then, as always, stay feisty. <laughs>been listening to hit play not pause a feisty menopause podcast for active performance minded women i'm your host celine yeager the show is edited and produced by the strong talented and amazing women at live feisty media follow us on social media at feisty menopause and please help us spread the word screenshot and share this episode on your social media channels with the tag at feisty menopause share the show with your friends And please subscribe, like, review, and rate this show wherever you get your podcasts. Word of mouth and good reviews make it easier for other listeners to find. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay feisty.